Kyle, if you only had one minute to give artists the best music marketing advice you possibly could, what would you say? Hey, Andrew, that's a really good question. So the best music marketing advice I could give somebody, probably something a lot of people don't want to hear. We're going to start off this video with a banger. You are taking a risk, whether you know it or not. Um, and what do I mean by this? So think about what we're doing. Music, we're artists. The root word is art. Art is very subjective. There's always a risk when you're putting yourself out there and promoting your music and putting it in front of somebody. Any number of things could happen. It could go right or it could go wrong. And the truth is with something as subjective as music, not everybody is going to like every piece of music. Somebody might not like your piece of music. You might not put it in front of the right people. So then, you know, somebody might ask, why do I even bother in the first place if it's just a gamble? Well, I'm really just saying this is because you have to be mentally prepared for any scenario. Because, you know, even the best laid schemes of mice and men often go awry. Um, but there are things that you could do. You follow best practices. You know, you watch Andrew's YouTube channel or you hire a professional consultant like me or Andrew to do your work that minimize the risk and make sure you have the most successful project you possibly could. And like I, like I said, it's all about minimizing risk. And this comes from my own experience promoting my own music. When I first started out, all of my projects went terribly wrong. And it's from the mistakes that I learned uh, a lot of what I know now, but anyone who's just starting out has to understand that, you know, you need to be prepared for when things go wrong and how to learn and recover and come back stronger from that. No, that was great advice. Okay. And um, I think a lot of artists don't realize that uh, most one, like things, you're going to fail a lot more than you're going to succeed in general. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, I think that's true with most things in life. Like YouTube channel stuff. I mean, I, I've uploaded 700 videos or something like that. And most artists, by the time that they're successful living off their music or whatever, they might have written hundreds, thousands of songs before anything happens. And there's a lot of risk, you know, both time wise and financially. Um, but yeah, let's let's get into how you started with the whole music marketing journey, because you you release music, I forget your artist name, but you, you release like like punk rock music, right? That's right, yeah. So my artist, artist name is Lens Eye, so-called because I wear glasses. It's just a portmanteau of lens and eye. <laughs> and um, would I really describe my music as punk rock? I don't even know what I describe it as anymore, but maybe that's the most convenient label to apply. Because um, looking back on my projects like you know, a lot of it's just kind of whatever I wanted to make at a certain point in time. Um, you know, I have been a musician my entire life, um, you know, from a family of musicians. So my grandfather played guitar. My dad played guitar. I kind of absorbed that. You know, my parents got me guitar lessons as a kid. Um, I really actually started as a bass player playing uh, the double bass in orchestras, um, classical music and stuff, and did that all through the end of college. I still have a soft spot for that kind of music. Um, but somewhere... Around, you know, the time when I was in college, which is not too long ago, I wanted to start releasing music. And I had this grand idea to make first an EP and then an album. Um, and, you know, like many musicians, poured my heart and soul into this project. And then at some point asked myself, how do I get people to listen to this? I don't want to just chuck it into the ether and then, you know, have nobody hear it. I want people to hear this and engage with it and really love it. And um, for at least the music marketing part of it, I actually stumbled upon your channel sometime in like March or April 2020, um, after all the lockdowns happened and, you know, everyone was at home trying to find new hobbies, things to learn. Um, and I started playing around with Facebook ads, following directions from your tutorials and um, had mixed success with promoting my own music in the beginning, as I alluded to earlier. Um, you know, I, I promoted a single, uh, a handful of singles ahead of my album. And, um, you know, releasing this album back in September 2020 was a huge project. And looking back, I don't know if I was prepared for it, but I don't know if anybody's ever prepared for something like that. Um, and I learned so much in the process of, of promoting that album, um, from, not only from the things that went right, but mostly from the things that went wrong, which goes back to what I was saying before about taking risks. And it was taking that risk and, you know, seeing the things that went wrong and really digging deep and assessing. Um, that I gained a lot of the knowledge that I have now. And then, you know, I started experimenting with things. I was in your Facebook group at that point too. And I published some 
uh, experiment that I was doing on a comparison on different landing pages, comparing hyped it versus toned in. Um, yeah. And I think you you noticed it and you, you picked it up and you said, hey, do you want to present this on my channel? And so I think it was like uh, fall of 2020. We ended up putting that video up where I was explaining some uh, experiment that I did and walking through all this arcane math. Um, <laughs> and that was kind of like a jumping point. I didn't know at the time, but that was a jumping point towards doing it professionally for other people. Because at that point, I had only done it for myself, for my own music. A handful of people saw that video on your channel. And I don't even know how they found my contact info because it wasn't <laughs> like directly linked on there. Yeah. But they tracked down my contact info. And you know, there, the first person to try to hire me was this band from Idaho and said, hey, we're releasing an album early next year. Can we hire you to do our music marketing? You sound like you know what you're doing. And I was super reluctant at first. Like I said, never had done it for anyone else. And he could tell I was waffling, but essentially he was like, please, we'll pay you. We'll give you money. You'll do a great job. It'll be awesome. And so it was it was a leap of faith on my part to trust that everything was going to work out and just, you know, try applying what I learned from promoting my own album just a couple months before to promoting his stuff. Um, again, it's like it was taking a big risk for me. Um, and it was a risk, risk that paid off handsomely, I would say, because um, I ended up growing this whole business, Kyle the Ally, out of that. That whole first experience that I had working with this band in Idaho was so great. And he was so happy with the work we did together that he's like, you know, you have something. There's a real need for this. Why don't you just do it for other people? And I was like, oh, I mean, it seems obvious, but <laughs> it wasn't to me at the time. And um the yeah. name Kyle the Ally came from a conversation that the one band member and I were having once over Zoom. He said, you know, what I wanted out of this process was not to hire some, you know, company that was going to handle my music and do these things. What I really wanted was an ally, somebody that I could trust, who understood the music and who I knew would handle my music like it was his own. And I remembered him saying that word ally from that conversation. And that's what stuck with me. And that's why I created this brand kyle the ally mm. you know i'm not trying to po pitch myself as some kind of marketing company rather you yeah. know an ally or you know somebody who can help you who understands the process and the emotions that go into this um to help you succeed in your projects so yeah yeah i mean i you know as someone else who also owns a, a essentially a music marketing ad agency for Bit media there's there's something that there's something to that, I think, from from the average artist perspective of of why people might decide to go with with us versus with us versus Kyle, the ally, you know, because they might want someone that's going to be it's just a different type of relationship. Right. Between working with like an individual versus like a company. And there's there's different reasons why. And I, I see why that first person might have felt that there was like this is like a, almost like a partnership kind of thing. So it's a cool brand you built. Um, <laughs> Thank you. And uh, the name's very easy to remember. And there'll be links in the description. Also, um, well, I guess I'll pin a little video there so people can check out that previous video that you did on the, was it Hyped versus Toned In? Is that what it was? Yeah, that's like, it's like ancient history at this point. <laughs> you know? And even from that, I've learned so many things now. Um, and I'm planning to do like, you know, another video. Maybe we can allude to that later. Um, but yeah. I'm, I'm planning to do another comparison of those landing pages with what I've learned now in 2023. Yeah. So on the on the note of that topic, the landing page discussion. Um, since then, you've you've kind of mostly become a fan of using hyped it specifically. Mm -hmm. So where did that come from? So that came from a, you know a couple of experiments that I ran. Um, last year and also just like the user experience of using the two different landing pages um, and people ask me this question all the time you know what you from clients friends whatever what do you recommend is it really worth paying the nine dollars a month that I need for hyped it versus the free toned in in my opinion yeah it is worth it I think hyped it has like features like the conversions API that I use all the time for everybody um, but also there was like something I found in, in the data when I ran an A-B test recently um, that indicated that Hyped It gives you a better quality of listener. Um, I'd have to dig back into the data. Like I said, this experiment's from a while ago, and I'm hoping to repeat it now in more like 
I don't want to say modern times, but <laughs> to, to make it a little, more, little bit more relevant to 2023. But I found that um, the correlation between what Facebook counts as a conversion to what actually ends up as a listener on Spotify was better with hyped at landing pages than it was for tone tone. And I don't really have a good hypothesis as to why it is. But what I can tell you is that, um, and this is something I've known from the beginning, is the Facebook ads manager treats hyped at conversions and toned end conversions very differently. Even though to a human person like you or me interacting with a landing page, clicking a button on a landing page is the same action, whether it's toned end or hyped, it's, you know, it feels like the same to us. But there's something in the inner workings of the ads manager that views them and treats these conversions differently. And the quality of the listener that you get off of each conversion is different. And for hyped it, I just found that it was better. My and my I, theory I, I, on that is that since Tone Den and also Artist Hub does the same thing, but Tone Den uses that view content event, which is what Shopify, Wix, Squarespace, WordPress, like WooCommerce, and every other, uh, including music funnels too. When someone looks at a product, your store will generally fire a view content event, which is what Tone Den uses. And so it's, it's one of the standard events. So I'm guessing Facebook just sees view content and they're like, the, it's like the, they're looking for the amalgamation of what every person on Facebook uses view content for, whereas hyped it since it's a, it's a custom event, it's only being used on hyped it. So when they see you use hyped it smart link click, it's more tailored towards music. And when you make a custom conversion out of that custom event, I believe it's a clean slate where they treat that mm -hmm. custom conversion like this. We have no previous assumptions about this. We're going to collect your data and use that data going forward. Same with Feature FM. It uses the, the, the uh, FFM event, and then you turn it into a custom conversion. I think it's like a clean slate kind of thing where that might be why a lot of people get better results with Tone Done faster than if they start with Hyped It, because like with Hyped It, there's like no assumptions if they use a custom conversion. But that's just kind of a... Kind of a theory. <laughs> yeah, I think I've come to a similar understanding too from you know my observations with my own music and in a professional setting is that there's a certain amount of I call it a priori optimization that happens with the tone down conversion. A priori is a Latin phrase. I think it means like from before or you know somebody who knows more than I do will correct me in the comments. But <laughs> basically, just like you said, because the view content conversion that Tone Den uses is built into Ads Manager. Ads Manager thinks it already has an idea of what to do with it, whereas the hyped it conversion is completely custom. Uh, Ads Manager is not trained to do something with it off the bat. It's just going to use the data it collects. So um, that's that's what I think also is, is the key difference, just like what you were saying. Yeah, yeah. Um. So you you have, and I think in, in the the first video you showed up on my channel, this was somewhere in the th title or thumbnail, but it, it was something along the lines of like MIT uh, MIT graduate like analyzes Facebook ad can like it's I did something with that in the title or thumbnail, and so you you have a degree from MIT in in like materials engineering or, or mechanical engineering or some related engineering field, and so yeah. It'd be cool just to get like 10 seconds on that, but also like, because I get this question too, you know, I, I have a background in mechanical engineering. People always ask me, do you have a degree in marketing? Do you have you worked in like marketing professionally? And it's just like, well, I have a degree in mechanical engineering. <laughs> so, and people always kind of wonder like, like music, marketing, engineering, they're two, they're three, two or three entirely different things. But I've always kind of viewed them as kind of the same. So I'm, what's your take on that <laughs> yeah i think they're certainly compatible so actually i'll rewind so um to answer your question yes i graduated from mit class of 2022 i have a bachelor's in material science and engineering it's like the official name of my degree um so it's like it, it's technically a science degree mm -hmm. um and i also have a minor in computer science so you know things like algorithm design uh, i took a whole bunch of classes on that i know algorithm is a big buzzword in the music field People ask me about that all the time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to, to get to your point of like, you know, how does an engineer end up working in music marketing? Um, I also get that question, especially from people at my day job when I mentioned to them, 
you know, I have the side business that I run on weeknights and they're like, oh, what the hell are you doing with music marketing? How did you get into that? Like, why, why would you even bother as an engineer? Um, I think they're entirely compatible skill sets, right? Um, as an engineer, you're basically creating these deterministic systems. So you have some data, you want to build something that solves a problem. Um, and then you're looking at data to see how you can improve and optimize. Engineering is all about optimization problems. When you put it in those terms, running a Facebook ad campaign to promote some piece of music on Spotify is not that different. You're designing a solution to solve a problem and you get data in the form of Facebook analytics or Spotify analytics that you can use to interpret your results and then make improvements. Um, and you know, I, that's why I think having an engineering background is, is really compatible for the specific quantitative type of marketing that you and I do. Um, there's a quote that I, I coined, and I don't know if anybody remembers me for any witty aphorism I've made up. It is a uh, numbers are a language, but you have to know how to speak them. And I think an engineer is really well equipped to speak the language of numbers. Yeah, totally. And, and another thing that I think is particularly good about, you know, if, if any of you watching are trying to pick what you're going to go to college for or something. Um, I partially picked, like originally I was going to go to college for music and then I saw the bill. I got accepted to Berkeley for the program and, and there was like 50 grand a year plus room and board. And I, I did, you know, I didn't, didn't come from a rich family or anything. So I would have had to take out loans for practically the whole thing. And I was like, nope, took a semester off, went to community college for a semester and then uh, figured out that I wanted to do engineering because I thought business was boring. <laughs> I originally started off business and I was like, I feel like I can teach this my, to myself. This is boring. And then I get really interested in NASA and I went to aerospace and went to mechanical. But my kind of plan was I'm going to, if I'm not going to go for music, I'm going to go to college for something that I'm, I'm also interested in that pays really well, has long-term safety net that will give me enough money to be able to do whatever I want with music for the rest of my life. Like, even if I can never make the music thing work, I'll be able to buy whatever music gear I want. Right. And mm -hmm. I think I like if, if, if you're if someone wants to go to school for music, it's like, great, go do it. But I think for most people, the answer is uh, probably don't do it because I worked at Starbucks for five years in college. I worked with so many people who had degrees from Berkeley School of Music, other prestigious music programs. And um, but yeah, I agree that the whole data anal analysis thing, like sometimes I'm ex like explaining certain stats to a musician that has no background and they're like, oh, wow, like I never like, how'd you do that? I never thought of it. And to, I, I think there's a lot of things that we take for granted with a science background that a lot of people um, just don't find as easy. And so I, I think that they're totally aligned, like even something just making a spreadsheet to graph results. When you have a technical background, it's like you don't even think about it. Like, let me just put up a spreadsheet, take five minutes. But like, uh, if you have never done that before, it's like you start sweating, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd say even, you know, going to a school like MIT or any engineering school for that matter trains you to think with a certain level of rigor and to not take things at face value. Um, and of course, like if you have a science degree, you learn, you know, things like how to do an experiment, separation of variables. Um, things like, you know, all the stats that show that what you're actually testing is a real result and not due to random chance, things like that. And it's it's a really engineering and science are all about just methodical ways of getting down to the truth or at least the best best truth as we understand it. Yeah, absolutely. So you run a lot of Facebook ad campaigns for music. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it'd be good. Because one question I get probably more than anything is my cost per result is really, really high. How do I get it lower? <laughs> and mm -hmm. there's a, you know, there's a million ways to answer this question. But if someone just leaves you a comment on a video or something and says, my cost per conversion is a dollar fifty cents or something really high. I'm a pop music. I'm a, I'm a pop music artist. And. I'm, I sound like so-and-so artist, and this is what I've tried. Like, what kind of steps would you give them or order operations to go through to try and figure out and get their costs down to something at least manageable, but ideally great? Yeah, I'm going to, I'll kind of work off the cuff, even though, you know, I have like a formalized 
way of, you know, an order of the way I'd work off of things, but off the top of my head, what would I do? Um, you know, so if, if things are going wrong, then you have a license to start making changes, but of course be methodical about the changes you're making. Um, avoid making 10 changes at once. Cause then you don't know what actually solves your problem if you did or what made it worse if you made it worse. Um, and that's a mistake I fell into in the beginning, but I would start at looking, um, at the audiences. So if you are getting poor results, a really high cost per conversion with the audience that you're using, maybe you should start by opening up your audience because sometimes we fall into the habit of strangling the, the Facebook ads manager. Um, I don't want to say AI because that's such a tired <laughs> catchphrase right now. Well, we, we get caught in the habit of strangling Facebook ads manager by saying we need to target fans of Dua Lipa who also um, – work at Starbucks on the Tuesday shift and um, drive this car and they live in Boise, Idaho. Um, you know, that's, a, that's a, of course, is a comic exaggeration, but um, we fall into the habit of being very specific about who our listener is. Sometimes you just have to take a step back and acknowledge that maybe there are other demographics that you haven't considered that could also like this music. So if you're, if you're targeting fans of Dua Lipa, maybe take a step back and just target fans of pop music. Um, or just shotgun blast a whole bunch of artists that are operating in that sphere to cast a really wide net and start by seeing if you can get an improvement with a wider audience and just giving the ads manager time to use the extra options that you've given it to re-optimize and find that niche within that umbrella that really likes your stuff. After that, I'd start looking at the creative. So things like, um, you know, the video oftentimes is just a video you have, um, but you could do clever things like you can shuffle the thumbnails because um, the thumbnail is the first impression that you make on an ad. It's the first thing people see when they're scrolling through Instagram, whether we like it or not, the visual leads, not the music. And um, sometimes you could just try a different thumbnail and see, well, maybe this one is actually going to catch people's eyes better. Um, I've had success in the past changing the captions that I use, um, the little text that appears below your video. Um, you know, previously I had been running an ad campaign that had no captions. It was failing miserably. And then the client and I sat down and we brainstormed a whole bunch of new ideas that we thought were attention grabbing. Um, and we just pasted those into the ad and it turned around the performance of the ad. I was actually shocked. And that's when I learned the importance of writing a good and catchy caption. Um, so those are kind of the things that I would, I would work through. Um, and I would also make sure, you know, you haven't, back to what I was saying about using an ad set with a broad audience, but don't use too many ad sets at once because you don't want them competing with each other. Um, so you might decrease the number of ad sets, but the number of ad sets you keep use a wider audience. Gotcha. So there's, there's a few things in there that I wanted to comment on. So the first thing, uh, broadening the audience. So totally agree, by the way. Uh, this one, I just want to add some point that I've had people, you know, tell me like, I have trouble figuring out what to target. I want to target Juice World and XXX Tentacion or whoever you say that guy's name. And they're not on Facebook and there's nothing for me to do. And then I tell them target Post Malone, target Lil Peep, target Machine Gun Kelly, target someone else. Like, I don't sound anything like Post Malone. I don't sound anything like Lil Peep. I sound like Juice World and X, like two to Facebook, Post Malone, like it, it's more than close enough, you know? Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of artists get stuck in this trap of like, this is who I sound like. I sound nothing like this. But when you break it down to like, what, what's the general vocal style? What's the general genre? What do the instrumental sound like? You can often f think of like 10 times the number of artists. Like I don't sound anything like Post Malone. But if you break up the elements of my music, like, somewhat gritty vocals with electronic based instruments, but often having guitar. It's like my music fits that bill and a lot, a lot of the songs. So it makes sense. So I post them would work or Lincoln park. My solo music doesn't really sound like Lincoln park, but what does Lincoln park do? They blend electronic and metal and rock and pop. And what do I do? I blend all those things together. Um, it's interesting that you actually test out the thumbnail because mm -hmm. my, assumption is what's always been that because like on reels and stories you never get a thumbnail and explore and feeds the only way you get a thumbnail is if you're on a phone and you have the data saver option on so if you found that 
when you, you it actually makes a difference. Sometimes it does, and you know, sometimes it doesn't. I'm not claiming it's a silver bullet solution. Yeah. But um, like I said, you know, in certain scenarios, um, like you're saying, if your phone's on data saver, or whatever, scrolling yeah. through Instagram, um, you know, someone on bad Wi-Fi um, is going to see the thumbnail. It's like the first impression you're going to make. So you want to make sure it's a nice, well composed image. It has a subject. It's clear. Things like that. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I might actually start paying more attention to it then. Because especially if you're targeting countries that have or are more developing or have worse connections, like, uh, you know, I don't want to stereotype any com- any country, but I would imagine that this cell connection and cellular plans in, in Mexico aren't as reliable as they are here in the U.S. Just a complete yeah. generalization. Don't burn me for it in the comments, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, it's like so it makes sense. Like if you're targeting Mexico. And if there's a lot more percentage of people with bad cell connections or they don't have unlimited data, um, that it would help, you know? Yeah. Or even outside the U S in general, like you'd be surprised. I lived in Germany for, you know, a small portion of my life. And even the internet that you have there is nowhere near as fast as it is in the U S most of the time. Oh. Um, cause I remember like first moving there and, uh, the supervisor I was working for at the time, was like, oh, that's so cool that you do this thing with like video conferencing, but don't expect too much out of the uh, the broadband internet in Germany. And I was like, okay, <laughs> and it was true. You know, even you think of Germany as like it's it's a very developed nation. Um, yeah, you know, one of the wealthier nations in the world. Um, but you know, outside of the U.S., a lot of countries struggle, um, even even in the developed world, with internet connection. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a cool tip then. The the captions I found a lot of artists ignore as well. They'll put nothing in. And part of that might be my fault because in the past I would put nothing in there. And, you know, at this point, I probably a hundred YouTube videos where I put nothing in there. So people just follow those old videos. But like for the last year, maybe even two years, I've kind of made it a mission to either put like a lyrical quote or describe the genre of music like dark atmospheric alternative pop or whatever, Um, Mm -hmm. or even just describe the message of the song or call out like for fans of Breaking Benjamin, or if you love Machine Gun Kelly, check this out. Um, what kind of, are there any kind of templates that you found outside of those that that work for captions? Yeah, I'll say captions are, are always the number one thing artists struggle with when they hire me to help them with their ads. Uh, it's not a skill that comes naturally. It's something I've gotten a lot better at just from practicing it over hundreds of campaigns at this point. Um, but you know, I have, if if somebody hired me, I have like, you know, some templates that they can work off of. I actually give them a document of like, you know, these are examples of what have worked in the past. Um, this is, you know, templates that you should, um, you know, think about crafting it around, but in general, make sure it's not longer than one sentence and even, you know, a phrase, even, um, you want it short, sweet to the point, nice and punchy. Um, and you know, things like, um, one that sticks in my mind that was a really successful one um, for a metal band that hired me. Uh, the caption we used was, this is a song for people who live for the mosh pit. One sentence long. Um, and the way we kind of made this was I was, you know, I was talking to them about their genre and I, I listened to a bit of metal music. I'm not like a huge metal head, but put yourself in the shoes of a prospective listener. What kind of person listens to your music? What do they enjoy about the kind of music you make? Um, you know, somebody who likes metal music goes concerts. Um, they might like the raw intensity of that kind of music. Um, they like the feeling of being in a mosh pit. Um, and you know, it's, it's something you could tap into that somebody who is already looking for music in the genre would recognize and be like, yes, that's an experience I enjoy about this music and connect it to this song. If this song has that experience then I'll enjoy the song. And yeah. that's kind of how, um, yeah, and a lot of times being quirky too, or like asking questions. Um, like one artist that hired me had a, a music video. The whole concept was like they're in this like haunted Chinese restaurant. It was really interesting. It was a really cool project though. Uh, very creative. And the caption was trapped in a haunted Chinese restaurant. What could go wrong? Question mark. <laughs> yeah. so don't be afraid to be quirky or out there. Yeah, I, one example I've had is for pop punk bands to do something like remember Warp Tour question mark or remember the good old days of Warp Tour or something like that because 
I remember Warped Tour, like the best co- festival concert experience ever. And my like, just such a nostalgic thing. Like if Warped Tour came back, I would go every year till the end of time, just because I, I missed a few mm-hmm. years in a row and now it's gone forever. Um, and so I feel yeah. like, and I'm not even that big of a pop funk band. I'm normally a metalhead. And that's like, you know, but that's powerful. If I saw an ad that's like, mentioned some kind of you know or this a song for metalheads a song for you know song for the mosh pit i'm not a big mosh pit guy i'm usually just pissed off the whole time i'm at a metal show and people are like bumping into me i'm like i just want to watch the band <laughs> like but you know it's it you the more you can get into a listener's head and understand them the better i think mm-hmm. and and if for now actually this is another topic we can branch into what do you think works best for the actual video because I I normally tell people do do either performance footage if they can do like a social media style performance videos either real performance or lip sync uh, if if they're not a performer use stock footage and cut up some footage that would align well to the song um, lyric videos can work but usually not the best and visualizers usually not a good option some genres work and then static artwork things generally avoid what's your mm-hmm. kind of best best practice list so the exact recommendation i'd give somebody would depend on their genre um and there's some trends that i've learned by the genre i'd say you know it's my professional opinion that the quality of the video you use is the single biggest predictor of a campaign success um whatever you do with your video you want it to be um, nice and high quality i always tell people don't shoot your video on an iphone um just the color, the color gamut of an iPhone camera is not that good. Uh, the lens kind of gives you weird fisheye distortion. Um, usually the lighting is also not that good. Um, you want to make sure that um, you're shooting something that's well composed, well lit, has nice colors. Do a color correction too in post. Um, there's no shame in that. Um, and, you know, I, I always recommend people, if, you know, if you don't have a huge video budget, you don't need to hire a professional and spend thousands of dollars. You could just get a friend who has a nice camera and knows how to use it to help you shoot a music video. And I learned this lesson when I was promoting my own music for that album. We did a music video where we just um, we went to an abandoned factory near my house where I grew up in New York. And we um, just put a couple of, you know, Canon uh, DSLR cameras on tripods. And it was just a video of us performing through the song. Uh, we switched between different angles, um, but it was, you know, the lighting was cool. The scene, the scenery was really interesting because it was all like urban decay and it matched with the theme of the song. Um, and that was like my most successful music video <laughs> to date. Um, and yeah. so that's why I always strongly, strongly recommend make sure you put a lot of care and effort into your video and make sure you're putting your best foot forward with the video. Now, you know, for specific genres, um, if you have anything that I would call guitar music, um, very broad <laughs> umbrella term. So that'd be like, that like rock, metal, country. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Rock, metal, country, uh, pop, punk, punk, what, you know, whatever. If it's guitar-led music, um, th- those audiences like to see performances. Um, they like to see a band. In particular, they like seeing drummers. I don't, I don't know why. That's, a, just that's an I'm interesting afraid. observation. I guess watching yeah. drummers is a lot more interesting than watching guitarists normally because like drummers just move more. It looks like what they're doing is exhausting. And like, you know, look, look at the band tool. Mm-hmm. It, like with those Danny Carey performance videos go super viral on YouTube because mm-hmm. he's just like, I mean, it's just so crazy to watch, but like a, a technical guitar video, like a Steve I or a John Bertucci video, it's not going to go super viral on YouTube in general, not as viral as the drumming video. But that that's a very yeah. interesting ad observation that I've I've never tried. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you know that that kind of music is all about performance. Let's see what else would I recommend. I usually steer people away from lyric videos just cuz I generally don't like text on ads to begin with. Um not to say that lyric videos and visualizers don't perform well. Um certainly I've had campaigns that I've run where an artist gave me a visualizer or lyric video and it went well. But I've seen also plenty of them not perform well. Um, and I keep coming back to this idea of risk. Um, the kind of video you choose kind of determines the risk where you could you could do something like, you know, a lyric video. Um, it's a riskier choice than doing, say, like a performance video if you're a pop punk artist. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. The one interesting thing is on the on the camera note. 
I would generally, I generally tell people that like, use a phone <laughs> to film your, to film your ads. But on the color grading thing, I, it is a good idea. I think to, if you have a way to make your video look larger than life or almost surreal, like color grade the sky to make it like slightly green or like orange or something or pink or or whatever, you know, like color grade it to make it like dramatic and noticeable and bright. But like the camera thing, um, usually I've, my methodology has been like, yeah, just like it doesn't matter. Film on a phone because like on Instagram, they're going to downgrade it to 720p anyways. And like, your phone could film 4K. But I, the, the lighting is, I agree, it's like super important. Like I would say you could you could film your ads on an iPhone 5 with this whatever shitty camera they had back then. If the if the lighting's good and the framing's good and the shots cool, like I think that's the only thing that matters. But um mm -hmm. I don't know, have you run an AB test on that <laughs> for like quality? No, I I don't have a like a rigorous AB test on that and you know Something I'm proud of is that I have a lot of A-B test, tested data and I like standing on data and results, but yeah. admittedly, I don't have an A-B test for that. Um, we'll have to get one. It's just something I've noticed <laughs> on historical trends that certain types of videos perform better, certain yeah. types don't. Um, when I say don't use an iPhone, that's not a hard and fast rule. I'm not saying you will fail if you use an iPhone. You just There's extra steps that you have to do to make sure it looks it looks good. Like you're saying, like, you know, doing color correction post, you might have to do like a lens correction yeah. so it doesn't have like a fish eye effect because you have like a 1.8 millimeter lens on your iPhones um, <laughs> versus a 50 millimeter lens on a DSLR camera. It's going to look very different. Yeah. Um, and you you just want to make sure it looks, you know, it's composed nice. Um, you Basically, when I say don't use a phone, it, it's just a like a, a way of describing a catch-all of like, don't, how do I say this without sounding mean? Don't don't make a video like an amateur and make it look like an amateur. You know what I mean? And I yeah. don't use the word amateur as an insult, but I think like for the certain genre of cell phone video, it comes with other assumptions like the lighting is going to be bad. Um, they're yeah. not going to use a proper tripod. They're not going to color correct. And it's it's going to look obvious like it's a smartphone video. Um, yeah. But if you use a smartphone, you you know, if you put the attention to detail into all the other aspects, you could still nail that video. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh, honestly, it too, like, you know, this is similar to the camera that I'm using to film my video right now. I mean, this is like a slightly fancier version of that. But I'd say mm -hmm. a camera, like, a, this is a Canon EOS R7. The one I'm using now is a Canon EOS R, but they have a cheaper one that's the Canon EOS RP. And, like, the R, I think, is, like, 1,700. The RP is, I think, 1,000. I think this is, like, 2,500 or something. And it sounds like a lot, but cameras last a long time the lenses last even longer like decades i have some lenses over there that are just kind of niche lenses that are from like like the 80s or something and they still work with adapters and um i'd see that that's like one of the best investments an artist can grab and it can be a 500 hundred dollar canon dslr mirrorless camera um you can do everything on your phone yes and a lot of stuff you probably still will do on your phone but for getting like professional pictures for like just headshots for social media or for your your um, your your profile pictures and then and making videos that are important it's like you'll you might spend 500 bucks in a camera use it for seven years like it's it's it sounds like a lot but it's really a no-brainer i think yeah i i agree that it's a great investment but this is also an area where i encourage people to leverage their network um when we made that video for my song corporate advertisement the one i was telling you that was in the factory yeah. i didn't really have a nice camera at the time but i had friends who were going to school for um you know film and cinematography who had access to um uh rentals or like uh, they could sign out a camera basically from their school mm -hmm. and use it for projects and so they basically ended up coming along with me and using those cameras to film the video and then they ended up putting it in their portfolio and it was like a win-win for everybody um i feel like most people have that one friend or family member who's into photography or video um and you could just ask like hey are you interested in um if not helping me out maybe you could show me the ins and outs of how to use this camera and i could just borrow it for a day and then give it back to you yeah i think that's i, I think of a lot of people i know that have good cameras and maybe it's because 
you know, I know a lot of creative people, but that being said, I like my wife has a DSLR, you know, like she's had it since before we met each other because she was big in photography. And you'll find a lot of people who like took a photography class in college or a friend that just like likes taking pictures of birds on the weekends or something, you know, that you could mm-hmm. probably would let you borrow it or just like hang out for an hour and film you doing something. And honestly, that goes pretty far for like other tasks you might need help with too. There's, there's a lot of little things in, that you might encounter, like it, it, where if you, if you knew a bunch of people that are do various things in the music world, like, Hey, I need some help mastering my song. You know, if you're, if you're pals, they'll probably just do it for free. Because mastering is pretty quick or like, hey, I can't get this guitar tone to sound right. Like, what do you use? You know, and networking is pretty great. I hate I hate it when people go on like YouTube channels or or podcasts or whatever and say like the power is in your network. You got to build your network, get a network more because it's just such a hard thing to like tell someone to go do. But yeah, over the years, one of the most valuable things in my life has been like essentially like the people, you know. (laughs) <laughs> like what 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 can you accomplish not just on your own but like with all the people you could contact what kind of things can you put in motion um so yeah knowing people it's a good thing <laughs> yeah it's like there's always like those cringy like millionaires on youtube they're like yeah. oh i was actually just watching one of those videos earlier not by choice youtube like decided it was going to autoplay it in the background while i was cleaning up my room it was like this like 20 year old you know 20 something guy who made like 42 million dollars in his 20s and he's like oh just leverage your network you know get more friends <laughs> like, oh if only it was that easy we'd all be <laughs> right right that's that's the cringy thing that but it's like it is useful if you just like the nature of making more friends who do what you do or have skills that are related to what you do like it it pays off so much long term and Pouring yourself out on Instagram is not the way to do it. Or like how people were doing it three years ago. What was that stupid audio app that everyone was using for like a week? Clubhouse. Clubhouse. <laughs> they would hop on and just hang out in these eight hour long chat rooms and build their network or whatever. And either way, rant over. I don't want to spend too much time on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, when you do these A-B tests, like as you mentioned, you do these rigorous A-Bs. Do you mm-hmm. use the formal Facebook ad A-B testing tool or do you do it manually in some other way? So, yeah, I do use the Facebook A-B tests uh, function, but only for one specific reason. It's only one part of the experiment. When you use the A-B test feature in Facebook Ads Manager, what it does is um, it's basically taking the two or you know however many ad sets you include in that um a B test and it's making sure their audiences don't compete with each other and your ad sets are not driving artificial competition against each other. And so um that's kind of just a like a part of what I say when I mean uh that sorry, that's just a part of what I mean when I say running an A B test. The data that Facebook spits out at the end of the A B test I found is never useful. <laughs> I would rather just track key metrics that I care about in a spreadsheet basically day by day to paint a picture. And then at the end of two weeks, when my test is done, um, I could do some statistical analysis, like confidence intervals, things like that, hypothesis testing to look at the results that I got. So the A-B test feature is is part of the puzzle, but I'm also building an entire experiment around it. And that's what I mean when I say A-B test. Gotcha. So you use the A-B test tool so that they don't overlap audiences. And I haven't used the tool in a while. But I'm guessing that I, last time I used it, you could decide like between I'm going to make two audiences and I'm going to change this one variable like detailed targeting metrics or ages or whatever. Or you could do an A-B test where like the only variable you're changing is the ad creative. Um, is that still the case? Yeah, to be honest, I I kind of just ignore like when you're setting up the A-B test and ads manager, when it says choose your variable that you're segmented by, choose the metric of success that we're going to measure this by i kind of just i just choose like a placeholder thing and I kind of ignore it because i'm collecting all my own data on the back end it, you know gotcha. i don't really care about what facebook spits out as a result i just care is it separating my audiences to make sure they're not competing mm. gotcha how much money would you put into an a b test typically 
Um, I think the budget is like um, $280 per, across two weeks if you're testing two, you know, uh, a variable with two different experimental groups. And I That's think a that very specific to, number. How did you get such a well, specific number for that? <laughs> well, $280 divided by two weeks, that's $140 a week. Divided by two groups, that's $70. So it's like $10 a day, basically. $10 a day per ad set. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Now, have you tried doing like half that budget? Does it, does it, does it work fine? Or like if someone, if someone uh, had yeah. like a smaller budget, like can, can they still run a meaningful A-B test? Or I'm guessing the answer probably kind of depends yeah i tried um doing basically half that budget and seeing if i could get away with just running experiments for one week and what i found is it's just not enough data to have confidence in the result not saying that you can't get anything meaningful out of it but more data will always make you more confident yeah and i have just found in my experience and uh, in the beginning, when I was testing out just the methodology on how to do this in the first place, two weeks is the sweet spot. It's not too short where, you know, you're not confident in your result. It's not too long where you're blowing a whole bunch of money for no reason. I just I just found that, you know, two weeks, roughly three hundred dollars is is a good uh, time frame and amount of money to spend. And that's for two ad sets. Now, what if you were doing something with more options so not just like A versus B? but it's like A versus B versus mm -hmm. C versus D. Those four options for the variable you're testing. Yeah, then you then you could just scale it up. So like I said, $10 a day for each ad set. So let's say you were doing A versus B versus C versus D. That would be $10 a day times your four ad sets times 14 days, and there's your budget. Gotcha. Okay. So you, 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 just, you, you tend to find that 10 bucks a day per ad set, and then it's just a multiple of how many, how many options you're testing. And so that's right. Yeah. And I, I recommend, you know, at the ver the bare minimum, you probably want 10 days worth of data. Yeah. Um, I like, you know, two weeks is just 14 days. It's a convenient time window. Um, but when you're doing your statistical analysis, you know, this is where stats gets a little bit subjective, but I like having at least 10 data points if I'm ever going to draw a conclusion on anything. Right. And just to clarify, you're not, you're not doing an AB test every time you launch a campaign for a song. You're doing A B no, test no, no. to learn a specific fact about the nature of this type of or whatever type of ad campaign you're doing. Like you want to know in general if like if I have an ad with text versus an ad with no text or visualizer versus a thing, um, which one tends to work best? Yeah, so that's I think you hit the nail on the head. So when I run an A B test, I'm running that for myself to advance my knowledge and understanding of how Facebook ads work, you know, what choices are, are the best to get the best results. Sometimes clients commission me to do these A-B tests for them. Um, by the way, that's something I, I've done. Um, but if a client comes to me and says, here's my song, I want to promote it on Spotify. No, I would not run an A-B test on that because they're paying me for a result. Yeah. And that's where I'm going to use the knowledge that I've gained through all the A-B tests that I've done to know what are the best choices to make how to best set up the campaign um, and to give them the best result possible. Cause I don't, I don't want to experiment on a client's project. That's just, I feel like it's ethically not right. Yeah. Well, the reason I say that is cause a lot, I've had people message me when they, cause I'll mention the, the phrase AB testing a lot in videos. Like the reason why we want to have multiple audiences and multiple ads, because you want to be able to split test or AB test these different variables. So Facebook can put the money behind the thing that works best. And then people hear me say split test or AB test when I'm really, you know, I'm really not using the language, right. But it's just like, it's just a way what you'd be call it a split test essentially. Um, as people hear that and they're like, Oh, so I should use this AB testing tool every time I make a campaign. I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> um, yeah. Good. Yeah, I, I do test things when, you know, I'm hired to work on a project. I wouldn't call it an A-B test because it's not rigorous. And what I mean yeah. by that is, like, let's say they have, like, four ad sets running. And they say, oh, let me try adding in this other artist. Let's try promoting Machine Gun Kelly alongside these other four audiences that we have running. So I'll make a new ad set for Machine Gun Kelly and run it alongside the other four and just give it a couple days and see, you know, which one comes out on top. What's the performance look like? Um, that's 
of course, a test, but it, I don't call it rigorous because I didn't do a proper separation of variables. Yeah. I'm not ensuring that every ad set spending the same budget, and I'm not you know, setting up the features behind the scenes to make sure all of those audiences are non-competitive. And the reason I don't do that is because, you know, when you're experimenting, you're you're trying to find out a result, but sometimes you make a step backwards. Yeah. And when I'm running a, um, a campaign for a client, you could kind of just, you know, hot test things. It's okay. You don't have to be rigorous because you just want to deliver the result quickly. Yeah. And the knowledge base that you have from the other A-B tests you did in the past are informing the choices you make now. Gotcha. What's the best result you've ever driven? And what's the worst result you've ever driven? Excluding like the first few campaigns you ever ran when you were learning. <laughs> yeah. Are you talking like in terms of cost per results? I think like cost per results slash Spotify results. Like if there's some like a mate, like this person got this crazy low cost per conversion, we delivered this high stream count within this period. And then on the flip side, what's the worst version of that? <laughs> yeah. So disclaimer, I don't remember like exact numbers off the top of my head, but I have gotten down to something like seven or eight cents per conversion, even in the post like iOS 14 era. Um, you know, everyone likes to talk about that big specter of the iOS update that made things harder to, to track data and get good results. And then I found out there's things you could do to recover that performance and to get yeah. closer to what we had before. So, you know, that's, that's something I'm really proud of is that I, I have delivered, you know, eight ish cents per conversion. And um, even to like niche artists, um, like there's some artists who are releasing music and didn't really have a presence on Spotify. And then after we worked together on a couple of campaigns, they now have several thousand monthly listeners just in the couple of months we were working together. So that's really cool. Um, yeah. worst results. I mean, unfortunately there's no ceiling for how bad a result can get, <laughs> yeah. but I've definitely seen things that are like, you know, close to a dollar over a dollar per conversion. You never like to see it happen. Yeah. Sometimes it happens. It goes back to what I was saying about risk is that you can't predict how somebody is going to react to something as subjective as a piece of art. Um, yeah. and it's, it's always like hard breaking the bad news to a client and say, you know, this misperformed. Um, but it's part of, it's part of the, the way it goes. Yeah, I've I've had times where I, I get get a song to run for someone and it's like the best song I've heard in a while. And then it's just a dumpster fire. And then we get another mm -hmm. song that I'm running for someone. And I think it's well, not so much nowadays, but there's been songs in the in the past when I didn't have so much work, I could like turn down what I wanted to. And I was like, ah, this song sucks. But they want us they want to do a campaign. Let's do it. And it just does amazing. And it's like, what is wrong with this world we live in? <laughs> but it, it's the nature of it, like one music subjective. So what's bad to you might be good to someone else and vice versa. But, um, and the other thing you said, like you've gotten con conversions that are like seven or eight cents in a post iOS 14 world. A, a lot of people claim that ever since iOS 14 came out, the campaigns have been bad. Facebook's ad, Facebook ads are dead, yada, yada, yada. The top five best campaigns I've ever ran have all happened in the post iOS 14 world. Like I've had multiple eight cent campaigns, a bunch of like 12 to 15 centers, 15 to 20 centers. Um, and I, I also had, I will say the only thing I've noticed in post iOS 14, like three years ago, a bad campaign, like a really bad campaign might be 60 cents a conversion. And now a really bad campaign might be like a dollar 50. So I feel like the worst things now do worse, but the good things do just as good. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know if you found that to be true or not. Yeah, it's like the, the variability of the results you can get has widened. And you just have to approach that with those expectations is that your your ceiling for how bad bad can be is higher now. Yeah. But the the floor for, you know, how low your conversion, you know, cost per conversion can go is still, you know, it might be harder to achieve eight cents per conversion, but it is by no means impossible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if we, we've apparently both managed to pull it off multiple times and like, we may be the experts at this stuff, but I've, I've had consulting clients that their, their first couple campaigns they ever ran did eight cents a conversion. Their music mm -hmm. was outstanding. At least I thought it was, but you know, they did it. And that means it's possible because those are just normal people, you know, just sticking around with Facebook ads in their spare time. They don't like, you know, 
like make a living talking about Facebook ads like we do. <laughs> yeah, man. So Kyle, the ally, um, what's the kind of, we talked a little bit about earlier what you do. What's the kind of scope of services that you provide for people, for those interested? Yeah, I'd say my bread and butter, 95% of the, the business that I do for clients is just setting up campaigns on Facebook ads manager to promote music on Spotify. That's like still like the hottest thing everybody wants to do. Um, and I feel like I've, I've gotten really good at doing that one thing. Um, so that's the thing, that's the service I deliver most frequently. That's what I'm most confident in doing, but I'm also, you know, offering other things such as, for example, Google ads. If you wanted to promote a music video on YouTube, I have experience doing that. Um, some TikTok ads, I, I really haven't done a ton of it. And I don't think TikTok TikTok's ad platform is like mature enough to truly compete with Facebook yet. Yeah. Um, but it's something I at least have touched a little bit of. And um, also, you know, if you're using Facebook ads to promote a playlist, that's something I've done. Or if you're interested in commissioning me to do an A-B test, like I was describing before, um, if you have some feature or something you want to try, um, that's also something. It's kind of like... Um, information consulting i don't i don't know if there's like a like a category for that um you should but those you're, you're going to start a whole new a whole new category of ad agency where all you do is professional feature split testing <laughs> data, data <laughs> consulting so I, I honestly I, I have to imagine that exists but i've never heard of it before so yeah, yeah i mean to an extent like i feel like real world consulting companies not that we're not like real um, that's a bad yeah. way to describe it, but Someone like, that Pepsi the big would consulting hire. firms that are out there in the world, um, do, do something like that. You know, they'll, they'll test things, uh, when a client hires them and they'll deliver that result and say, this is what you as the business should do to improve your yeah. sales or cut your costs. Um, that's what real consulting firms do, uh, is, is stuff like that. And, um, I, so those are kind of the services I offer. And I always offer uh, a prospect of client two flavors for working together. Uh, there's a consulting route, which is basically where you can buy my time by the hour. Um, and you're still responsible for making all the changes and all the outcomes, but I'll be there to coach you or to consult you, answer questions, walk you through step-by-step step how to do what it is you want to do. Um, or the agent route, which is where you basically invite me to your Facebook ads manager um, to run the ads on your behalf. I build the campaign for you using input from you as the artist, and then I'm responsible for managing it and then giving you the outcome. So those are like the two the two methods I offer people. Yeah. So for those of you who have been who've been looking for for another me, here's my competitor. Go check him out. <laughs> Links in the description. And uh, Kyle's been doing this for a long time, and I know he knows what he's doing. So I feel comfortable recommending his services. So check that link. Kyle, anything you want to tell people before we check out? Yeah, I guess one other thing. Um, I'm really excited that I'm going to be launching a YouTube channel uh, this month. I'm, I might actually concurrently synchronize the release of my first video with, with when this drops. Um, it's something that, you know, Andrew's always asked me, Kyle, why don't you have a YouTube channel yet? Why haven't you done it? Because I have experience doing that in the past. I started like a robotics YouTube channel in high school. Surprised it's taken me this long. But um, I'm going to be sharing, you know, a lot of my knowledge, best practices, things like that on the channel. Um, hopefully on a weekly or semi-weekly basis. So if you're interested in that, um, hopefully we'll also be putting a link to that in the description. You can go subscribe, um, follow my content, make fun of me in the comments, whatever you <laughs> want to do. It's all there for you. Go call them four eyes instead of lens eyes or something. <laughs> Shut up, MIT nerd, something. I don't know. But we'll think of some comment cool that you can that. go leave, leave on his channel. Anyways, thanks, man. This was fun. <laughs> thanks so much for having me, Andrew.